welcome, welcome. <laughs> the last part, part four, um, before I'll have to leave you. So uh, before I get too emotional, let's dive in and see what we've got for you uh, in this episode. So yes, as I say, it's the Biohacker's Guide to Fly Fishing. I'm Paul Gaskell and together with uh, John Pearson, we've put together this material for you. Uh, and yeah, we're up to the last bit where it's asking really, what are the next steps um, that you can possibly take with the system? So first of all, just a quick recap from uh, where we've been before. And actually sort of, again, getting to grips with this idea of biohacking in fly fishing, a, you know, kind of a slightly tongue in cheek term that we've used. But basically where you've got a fish, you know, it's actually it's it's spied your artificial fly. But something happens, you know, in, in between that sort of signal reaching that fish's brain, there's something that kind of, you know, frazzles the uh, that reaction and the, the nervous center there. And that fish then treats that completely artificial fly as if it was absolutely genuine food. So that it's, there's no difference to the actual natural food that it's feeding on most of the time when it's in the river. And of course, that, that pretty much describes fly fishing in, in general. But but where the biohacking aspect comes in, and the, the, the tweaks and the, the systems are a little bit different, I suppose, what we're trying to get at, is that... It's the context, the environment in which you put your artificial fly actually changes which is the most effective pattern. So the fish might be feeding on exactly the same food items, the natural food, but depending on how well you understand how to trigger off those innate responses, that's what gives that sort of hacking or hot wiring um, angle to the uh, the approach that we're sort of advocating here. So the fact that it's not the most perfect and the most photorealistic copy fly that is the best artificial pattern, it's the one that has the right triggers for the environment that you're fishing it in. And not only that, it's not only the fly and the pattern selection that's influenced by that environment, it's also how much stealth that you need to apply in a particular situation as well. And that is given you know, the cues that you take from the environment guide you on that as well. So if I just move myself a little bit out of the way uh, here for this next slide, we've shown you in the previous episodes a number of, well, what we think are really, you know, um, ideal examples. And it, it captures, as you'll see from this short sort of um, collection, of clips from the previous episodes, it spans a whole different range of fly fishing methods. So this is it. This is the one big idea that, uh, you know, again, all of these episodes are sort of trying to build up um, step by step. And it is this idea that the conventional way of actually learning the tactics that you employ on stream in fly fishing, you kind of learn them step by step and by rote. And it often involves learning lots of different local facts and whether that's the names of particular species of flies that hatch on your river or, or whether it's just, you know, the overall approach of taking that um, close copy tying of those individual species as the way to learn how to be successful. And I think those things are useful, but I think they come in the wrong order when we're learning about fly fishing. And what we really need, first of all, is a smaller number of generalized, universal, if you like, um, rules that are based on the biology of the fish. And if you understand how to exploit and how to tweak those responses and hotwire them, that's what gives you that kind of biohacking for fly fishes sort of approach. And I think it's much uh, more effective, much faster, and it's much more adaptable as well. So it's less um, fragile when the conditions are slightly different from the ones that you find in the textbook or, you know, from the last time that you were fishing or, you know, whoever you've been watching or, or learning from, you know, the advice and the guidance that they've given in certain conditions. So it's it's that really, you know, getting away from that prescriptive approach and having a more flexible system. And that's, that, and that's based on the biology of the fish it's themselves. The usual way up until right now <laughs> that we've taught this system to people, the main way at least is through our book, um, How to Fool Fish with Simple Flies. And it's a pretty large format, sort of eight inch by 10 inch um, coffee table format book. And it's full of, 
clear, um, hopefully, simple descriptions of the tactics and the concepts that we're talking about in these videos, but laid out in the system in the way that you can use them. And it's accompanied by, you know, the sort of illustrative photographs and diagrams as well that let you kind of get to grips with that entire system. And that's really been, you know, the, the, the main and the most useful way that we've found to kind of pass on this, uh, this uh, what you might call biohacking type approach. And you would be forgiven if you've read a copy or seen a copy of it, um, that it's, it's a book about, principally about Tenkara and European nymphing techniques, competition nymphing. And, you know, on one level, absolutely that's true. So, you know, yes, but and also no as well. And what I mean by that is that, yes, it's the perfect, uh, sorry, that the, the Tenkara techniques and the Euronymphing techniques, those schools of fly fishing are perfect example models of great applications of this type of system. Um, whether or not the practitioners that, that do them actually realize that or not doesn't matter. So the, so the book itself is a pretty solid description of, you know, particularly um, Japanese Tenkara techniques. And, and in many ways, it's, you know, that's really the only book in the English language that, that I know of that, that really lays out a lot of those detailed techniques that are applied um, in Japan. So on the one hand, it is absolutely that book that you sort of expect when you pick it up. Um, and again, the, the reason that these methods are such perfect models is that they're, they're not based around close copy fly tying and imitation. That's not to say they don't match the hatch, it's just that they use different triggers and different means of getting there. So it's not reliant on this close copy um, approach at the vice. What it is reliant upon is the fact that your presentation, uh, the skills that you use in your presentation and your knowledge of how to position yourself to make those presentations, those two things are absolutely everything in both Tinkara and competition nymphing as well. And it also, both of those uh, schools of fly fishing, they understand when to uh, exaggerate certain colours or movements in the artificial flies to get a stronger response, but they also understand when to really kind of tone down and whisper a little bit more with your presentation as well and be a bit more subtle about it. And not only that, there's a very strong element of you know knowing when and how to apply stealth um, when you're making those presentations and that sliding scale of how much stealth you need based on the conditions. So on that, you know, in that sense, yeah, it, it, it is absolutely that um, the book that you expect when you pick it up. On the other hand, what I would say is that well, what, where, does the, where does the no part of, the, of that answer come in if it's not um, only a book on, on those techniques? On the surface level, I agree, it is. But really, um, in disguise, and it's a pretty good disguise, I'll give you that, but underneath it all, there is a book hiding which is kind of um, a, an applied behavioural ecology book. Um, masquerading as uh, just uh, the, the fly fishing book on Tenkara and, uh, and European nymphing. The only difference between what you might sort of picture in your mind when you think of a, a biology textbook, which is maybe quite dry, um, is that, you know, we just use regular language wherever possible. And, and if there is the odd sort of unusual term in there, we make sure that we define it and sort of explain exactly what we're talking about in plain English. And there's a lot more stories than you get in textbooks as well. And we would think, and you know, we'll let you be the judge of it, but uh, we think there's a lot nicer pictures in there as well. Uh, and again, if you only think that it applies to those two schools of fly fishing, then you know you need to look a little bit harder and look again because there's there's so many ways that you can apply this to all of your river fly fishing. That's not to say it's perfect. You know, there are issues there's ne there's no one there's never been a perfect product that's ever been made and something that's come up in the you know the very kind responses that we've had when we've asked our audience about things and the pressures and the problems that they face a big one that comes up in the surveys that we put out um, the answers that come back is just the time available um you know people modern life and it doesn't matter if it's in retirement or during your working life uh, there's precious little time to go fishing, never mind to sit down and actually absorb uh, a new set of approaches and ways of thinking about fly fishing before you even get to you know, take that time out and go and sort of have fun on the stream, which is, you know, it's the most important bit. The other part of it is that when you read through the book, um, 
it's sort of, a lot of the information it's presented in almost a one-shot deal so there's a point that's covered and then you sort of moved on to the, the next bit and you see how it fits into the overall system but that comes from the, the process of when it was written uh, me going through that that writing process there's around about I mean, at least 11 drafts and now some are sort of more significant um, changes and drafts than others but there's at least 11 versions that we've gone through uh, whilst producing that book and a lot of that process is like you know like how do we do this do that bit over again but say it in half as many words and then sort of repeating that process and also reordering things so you don't have to kind of labor one point or duplicating the sort of the points that you make and that means that it's not an overly long book you know you can get that information it's really concise um, and it's as clear as possible the problem with that is that it's not that easy to retain and pick out some of the information the first time that you read it and this was flagged up to me recently uh, in a conversation with a good friend of uh, myself and John uh, is uh, Duncan uh, Duncan Philpot and this is he's actually a professional photographer this is one of his images um, of uh, it's a selfie and that's i'm not quite know how to, actually he set it up but it's a great shot but his work as a photographer uh it's relatively seasonal so he has periods with very very intense work and then times when he has a little bit more time just to sort of to go and and indulge uh, some of his interests and passions which include fly fishing over the last few years um, but also, you know, he has got that time to kind of really diligently absorb some of the stuff that uh, myself and John have put out there. Uh, and it was, you know, chatting to Duncan recently. And, you know, he mentioned that even after, you know, good, you know, multiple read through sort of six or seven times of reading through um, how to fool fish with simple flies, he is still coming up with new details that weren't apparent on the previous read through. Now, we're not we're not all in the same position as Duncan. So who the hell has got time to sit down and read through that book, you know, multiple, multiple times? So that's one of the drawbacks, I guess, of that kind of written format. Uh, and that's what, what sort of set us thinking, really. And it's the main reason that drove us to try and create something that you can consume at your leisure, on the go. You know, when you're doing something else, uh, whether that's you know commuting or traveling or you know driving to the stream even uh, exercising whatever it is you can actually be absorbing this and and the audiobook format it, it encourages repeat listens as well and that is critical um, it, it's it's that sort of repetition that familiarity that lets you absorb the ideas so that you actually retain them and it's far more useful than when you go back to look at some of the uh, written material uh, it means that you don't have to kind of reread it as many times to get, you know, close to the same amount of value that somebody like Duncan would get from, you know, just actually pouring over it um, in, in the physical format several times. Um, I know another one of our uh, good friends, Neil, as well, he was saying that actually he finds it very useful to read and listen to the audio at the same time. And that really sort of helps to kind of, you know, fast track that sort of embedding of the information, too. But as I say, it's really that, you know, getting away from the limitation of that concisely written print book. Uh, and to produce it into a format that's way more convenient to, to help lock in that information, really. And again, this is, you know, due in no small part to the, the feedback and the help that we've had from, from our audience, from you guys. Um, you know, super, super helpful in terms of guiding how we've actually created that to make sure it's as useful as possible. So between choosing between different formats, whether it's sort of download or sort of online, uh, physical CD versions, um, the way that we divide it up so that you don't have to you sort of try and scrub through a whole sort of three hour and 10 minute sort of long section to, to get to the bit that you want. All of those things absolutely vital in the making this product as, as good as it could be. Um, and that came from at least, I've not really counted up properly recently, but there's well over a couple of hundred replies in just a few days when we first put out that, that call for that assistance. So huge, huge thanks to everyone on that. Um, and that's really allowed us to kind of develop this product into, into what we've got um, in this, this current format. Uh, so without further ado on that, let's brace yourself for the, the full screen uh, experience of what we've actually cooked up for you. <laughs> 